Hey, thank you for clicking on the video. Before we start, we're talking about a Nazi-focused mod where the Nazis won World War II. It's going to be a lot of rough stuff that I'm going to be talking about, so if you aren't comfortable with that, I understand. So, how's this for some onanic nonsense? I'm going to be appealing to a small circle of people of an interesting critical analysis and a specific mod for a specific video game that is kind of niche in and of itself. So for those of you who don't know, Hearts of Iron 4, also called Hoi 4, is a game developed by Paradox Studios. It's a grand strategy simulation that simulates the economics and, to a far lesser extent, politics of the Second World War. It is front and center about the combat, and it's geared around conquest. You can play as any nation on the map, and many of the major ones have branching alternate histories. It's less about the simulation of World War II than it is about the simulation of armies, and I think its mission statement is pretty well summed up by the slogan Hearts of Iron 4, Altering History for Four Years, that went around during its recent anniversary. I don't consider myself a hardcore player, but it is pretty fun. Ignore a thousand or so hours I have in it, the fact that I have all but one DLC, and I'm developing my own mod for it alongside a team of others. I'm just a casual player. It has a robust modding scene from Kaiser Reich, which posits a world the Central Powers would won the First World War, to Red Flood, which shows a world in the grips of radical proto-fascist and futurist ideologies, where artists such as Antonina Toi rule. To today's focus, the recently released The New Order, Last Days of Europe. It's a mod that, if you hear the premise of, sounds like it would be mediocre. It's a Nazi victory scenario in which everything went impossibly right for the Axis powers, resulting in a total defeat of Germany's enemies, the nuking of Pearl Harbor, and the construction of Atlantropa's Gibraltar Dam, all within a space of 20 years. But despite the fact that people who aren't familiar with Hearts Fire and 4 would probably raise an eyebrow at that description, which I fully admit sounds like some Weraboo's wet dream, is one of the most fascinating depictions of such a world I think I've encountered. So, I'm going to be honest and disclose I used to write for the New Order, though I don't really know how much of that is still in there. I worked on Japan mostly, though I can't remember who I wrote for, either Hiro Ino or Hayata Ikida. I also worked a bit in India, though that didn't make it into the first release. I'm not really a critic from afar here, I'm looking at something I had a minor hand in bringing forth. It isn't my baby though, it's more like my second cousin twice removed. I'm going to be tackling this in three ways, initially by discussing the way it fundamentally alters the Hoi 4 gameplay loop for the better, and more or less produces an entirely new game, then discussing how these alterations help produce themes and a ludonarrative resonance, and finally discussing how the themes of the mod are conveyed through its writing, the special look at some of the more uplifting and depressing nations in the game. Sound good? Good. Obviously, massive spoilers for the mod. Part 1. Gameplay so, again, for those unfamiliar, here's the gameplay of Hoi 4. You choose a country, choose a national focus, a branching path that acts as part narrative and part upgrade tree, choose technologies to research, assign production to new factories, and start training divisions. Until they are finished, choose new focuses and techs, assign divisions to army, make new ones, repeat until you go to war. In war, select units and have them engage in battle plans. When you win that war, move on to the next. Very basic setup. Along the way, you'll see events happen from time to time, normally shown using their newspaper-styled announcement as if it's something global, or a document-brief-styled announcement for more local events. You can also make use of national decisions to further influence your nations or the nations around you. TNO doesn't actually change its cycle that much. Armies are of paramount importance, and there is plenty of war in this game, no matter who you play as. But it bu bumps up the importance of narration and events, even including its own super events, making narrations and its events the single most important thing to let you know what's going on. You often have to juggle three different time choices, many of which deeply impact later gameplay. The focuses are also given a personality, representing the specific goals and ambitions of a person in charge, as opposed to playing as a nation with a leader, you instead play as a leader of a nation. You get a real sense of the personality of the figure you're playing, and some of the flavor text is dripping with character. For example, if you play as the USA, you start with the dick who won't be licked, Richard Nixon, already in office. You see his focus tree partially completed, highlighting the potential lost and possibilities of his presidency. He could have gone clean, could have embraced isolationism, but he didn't. You get an incredible sense of Nixon's character and what he values, and you get a much greater sense of who he is compared to the people in the unmodded game who at most 
have a short description or a single trait that describes who they are. These two changes create an entirely different feel of gameplay. You still plan for war, but even in peace you need to keep checking on your nation. The influence of various factions in it, and what's being done and what you are doing. Your attention is split and divided, and while it is sometimes overwhelming, it's still a welcome departure from a formula you may be used to if you play vanilla a lot. Overall, this creates an experience that, at least for me, feels a lot more like you're watching a nation grow and develop. History in action. There's still people who may or may not vote for you in America. There's power struggles behind Spare and Borman and Goering, and the fact there's a whole world of people whose interests may or may not align with the players. Instead of the armies and officials and advisors being enslaved to the vast eldritch will of the player, you're playing a balancing game with them. Not only does this make it far more entertaining to play nations which may not be in perpetual war, but it leads to a lot of branching paths and outcomes. Overall, TNO feels less like a war simulator and more like a choose-your-own-history adventure set in a Nazi-dominated Cold War. All because it just adds more events and uses pre-existing systems in a, at least in my opinion, more effective manner than the game it's built from. In addition, though not unique to TNO, the mod also locks you out from declaring war randomly when all peace deals are pre-scripted. This makes sense, it's a highly narrative game, it would be weird as hell as you could break it that way. It also generally gives you a low stability, war support, and similar stats. Research speed is particularly low in some regions. In vanilla, it's rare to see any of those numbers go negative. In fact, you can't have negative stability, it just caps you at zero. This gives TNO a lot more flexibility in depicting various regions of the game, from the anarchic wastelands of Russia and Africa, not to be confused with the nations following anarchy as their guiding ideology, to the ultra-modern but unstable nation of Germany. And this brings us to... Part 2. The Narrative and Gameplay There's a concept that gets tossed around a lot, ludonarrative. Either it's dissonance or resonance, often described as a good or bad quality of a game. Many a great video has been made examining the Ludo narrative of different games. The thing is that a lot of the frankly best aspects of TNO's writing comes from the interplay between the narrative and mechanics. Hoi 4 seriously encourages a total inability to de-escalate, which is one of the weirder features of the game. Even when the war is over, it takes a long time for tensions to die down. And there's very little in terms of popular resistance if you just go and eternal war the world. While this is a slightly awkward feature that makes the late game extremely laggy and vanilla, with some division limiters coded in, and an emphasis on, on less open mass warfare and more on proxy warfare between major states or low-level raiding and warlord areas, it becomes a reflection of that Cold War buildup for wars between major powers that never really occurred. While a Cold War can go hot, than thermonuclear, the tense buildup of armies and arsenals that occurred in the real world is effectively replicated regardless of if the war goes hot. In addition, the feeling of, to use a clinical term, shit going down, is amplified by the sheer number of events that can overwhelm you. This is what happens when the German Civil War starts after the death of Hitler. It's just... it's just a lot. This narrative and gameplay connection is probably at its best when you're playing one of the Russian warlords, though. In the lore of TNO, after the Soviet Union fell, it collapsed and splintered into various states and warlord bands, ranging from East Siberian fascist states to West Siberian anarchists, from newly created monarchist dynasties to gun-running arms dealer states, from the levity of the democratic artistic haven of Tomsk to the scientific horrors of the Black Mountain in the Urals. These states represent the horrific chaos that occurs when the collapse of a central unified authority through violence occurs, and also the hope that such an event can bring. Socialists and Democrats and even a despot or two can have really good ideas and paths where their unification of Russia results in a better, more prosperous world for millions of people. 
but getting there is a grinding slog. You often have few resources with even fewer factories. Making your best units and keeping them well equipped is often very difficult, even in the later stages of a Russian game. You're raiding other, possibly good people just to build your own schools. You're spending the limited lives of your population, the oh-so-hard-to-produce guns, in order to lay claim to land that's just bitter ice and snow. None of this needs focuses or events to communicate. The frustration of seeing your manpower go from thousands to the low thousands to the mere hundreds as your divisions are depleted over time is apparent enough. The hopelessness of seeing your stats, that your schools will not improve for years and that your attempt to build a worthwhile life in the anarchy post-collapse always feels like your end goals are distant. War itself is its own hell as well. Even major powers aren't exempt from this. Instead of Italy sending thousands of men to the Turkish Levantine border, you're stuck sending advisors and watching the AI duke it out. Instead of Japan sending the full might of the co-prosperity sphere against the Mongolian communists, you have to watch your puppet flounder for months. More pressing matters than what amounts to a border insurgency in a puppet state on your mind. TNO makes fighting and watching others fight a frustrating experience, so you kind of can't wait for it to end. Successful maneuvers are all the sweeter for that, yes, but watching the line stagnate or seeing units wishing you could command them, just tell them to break out of the encirclement, keeps the futility of war at the forefront. This is what TNO communicates through its mechanics, at least to me. Part 3. Themes As the acclaimed writers of the famously well-ended Game of Thrones TV series reminds us, Themes are only good for 8th grade book reports, and normally I wouldn't actually focus on them if I was like talking about the majority of mods on the Steam Workshop. They all have them. It's impossible to produce a mod for a game like this without having some sort of thematic component, based on who's framed as good, who's framed as bad, so on and so forth. But I haven't seen one like TNO that hits so repeatedly on the same ideas across so many different nations. I've decided this should not be an hour long, so I'll restrict myself to three with a few examples each. Hate. Let me tell you how much I've come to hate you since I began to live. One thing that TNO never lets his player forget is just how much hatred there is in the various factions across its planet Earth. There's the Black League that spends all of its time preparing for the Great Trial, their euphemism for a Third World War against Germany where they take Berlin or die trying. There's the state of Ordenstadt Burgund, home of the Burgundian system, Heinrich Himmler's specific interpretation of Nazism radicalized and made more extreme by the quote revelation unquote that Hitler didn't go far enough and became decadent and lazy whose end goal is the annihilation of the individual in service to a state devoted to crushing the Untermenschen under its heel. There's also the partisans of Osterland, who want to kill as many Germans as possible simply for revenge, and intend to leave Osterland a burning wreck that cannot be salvaged. And a dozen more examples I could give. What drives many of the most radical, dangerous, and cruel people is simple hatred. They hate something more than they want to protect something, want to destroy whatever they hate more than they want to protect whatever they love. Fun fact, this was an interpretation that on my old Reddit account got a thumbs up from the creator of the mod, but even if it didn't have the creator's seal of approval, it's apparent enough in the game. It's clear that the ideology of people based on hatred of another is seen as evil. It's often not a mustache twirling evil, but it is still evil nonetheless. When you and your kind are extinct, we shall cleanse our collective memory of the stain of your existence. Purity. This is the heavy part. TNO concerns itself a lot with ideologies based around purity. Religious purity, racial purity, a social purification through blood and sword. That might be obvious given the conceit of the mod is a Nazi victory in the 40s, but there's many, many sources for this. It's best exemplified by the plan of Heinrich Himmler, whose intention is to bathe the world in nuclear fire, to destroy all non-Aryans in thermonuclear flame, 
and the merged and rolled ready to be taken back by its true masters. Of all of the bad people in TNO, he is the most comically evil, the one who seems almost like a parody. But outside of his nuclear designs, he's an extremely blunt representation of what totalitarianism needs to do to survive. Constant purges and paranoia. There is never someone pure enough to be above suspicion, and any failure is blamed on degeneracy. There will never be enough. Never enough purity, never enough Aryanism. From a pseudo-scientific racial testing to the betrayals of longtime allies, Burgundy is constantly trying to find, identify, and crush enemies that it perceives as lesser. The only way its system survives is if it can position itself as superior to something else. After erasing the French culture, after breaking the will of its vast slave armies, it will move on to another just to have something to contrast itself with. Even their fellow SS, if need be, are not immune from this. There's then also Comey, in which a na man named Taborsky can come to power. He believes that the holy and divine Tsarevich of Russia, Alexei Nikolaevich, has been speaking to him and wants him to purify Russia before the clock strikes midnight and his madness consumes him. Only then may his emperor return to his throne. To this end, mass purges and terror consumes Russia, targeting ethnic minorities, religious opposition, and political rivals. The use of poison gas and roaming death squads becomes a part of life. Doubters say that his emperor died years ago, but he just wants Russia to be pure before he returns, and it is not pure yet, so more must be done. And just to drive this all home, should you reunify Russia under his regime, the quote that you read is, Fiat Ustea et Periat Mundus. Let justice be done, even if the world itself must die. And then there's the horrors of various organizations of whom we only have fleeting glimpses of, such as the National Redemption Front, fanatical Catholics who purge unbelievers with fire and sword, and the National Purity League, ushered into power into Japan if the worst should come, who engage in nationwide purges, and if their super event text is any indication, it is a brutal state. Then there's also the Democratic Socialist Republic, a faction that can emerge in the Civil War of Germany who wants to cleanse all of Germany of Nazism and instate a socialist republic. Unfortunately, after 40 years of Nazi rule, there is no one they consider pure enough. We don't know enough about these factions to have definitive claims because they aren't in the first release, but the glimpses we've seen, I think, go quite a way to prove my point that TNO has an occupation with those who are obsessed with purity. Consistently, when obsession over that nebulous concept of purity occurs, it appears hand in hand with destruction, with hatred, with the desire to see the world plunged into fire. There's no ideology I've found in my game that both demands purity and doesn't cause horrific suffering, that wants to annihilate some other group and somehow doesn't hamstring itself. When someone comes up to the player, promising a paradise so long as we exterminate the impure group, TNO is basically waving a giant neon sign, telling you that their path is one of suffering and death. the third theme that I want to talk about. It's hit upon TNO time and time again. More than suffering, more than hate, more than the purity-obsessed people who want to ruin the world, hope is everywhere in TNO. From the wastelands of Russia, we have Rurik II, someone who styled himself king, but seems to be a man who legitimately wants to help and improve the people of Russia. He even allows unions, and if you go down one of his better paths, it only gets more and more liberalized from there, ending in essentially a constitutional monarchy. You have the anarchists who believe firmly in direct democracy and the ability of people to choose their own fates, though they can be subverted by an army that wants to control more and more of the goings-ons. You have Sablin, who is in fire born and likely destroyed, but if he survives, he can bring about a legitimately 
wonderful world for the people of Russia. You have Comey, which can go in a dozen different directions, but more often than not goes either democratic and bring about a democracy in Russia. For every warlord who wants to destroy and ruin, there's another who wants to help and raise up. And there's a lot more instances of this. Slaves in Germany can rise up in revolt and the National Socialist Empire can fall apart. Italy can reintroduce democracy and America can reignite the space race and go beyond the moon that the Nazis conquered and go to Mars. There's a lot of instances of good pulling through in TNO. People who will not go quietly into that good night and stand up to fascists everywhere. Her Majesty's most loyal resistance will fight tooth and claw for a free England. Poland will rise up and fight. Even though those fights are one-sided and often losing battles, they're fought all the same. The world of TNO is not oppressive, constant darkness. Every single group has some bad in it, and almost every really good path has ways to go down a much darker one. But what separates the good from the evil is their end goal. Those who just want to suck on and latch onto power, and those who want to destroy others, almost always end in something horrible. Those who want to lift up and protect not only can come to power, but often provide a beautiful and much more worthwhile life for the people under them. There is always something worth fighting for in TNO, some organization that's willing to stand for its people. Even if the worst of the worst gets in in every country, there is no promise its rule is absolute. Far from it. This was a balance that would be very easy to get wrong, to make the Nazi victory scenario be utter hopelessness. But it's saved from that, not by pulling punches, TNO does not pull punches, but by punching back, by showing fighting, by showing that there's not just suffering and agony, and there are people who are willing to fight and die for their freedom. TNO has some events can easily bring a smile to your face, or if you're particularly emotionally inclined, a tear. Playing as Sablin's Buryat Soviet Republic, and freeing the prison camps of Russian fascists, you'll get an event about two gay lovers realizing they're finally free to live their lives, because Sablin has not criminalized homosexuality. It makes me grin ear to ear. There are, there are slave revolts who take their chance at freedom, and even the leader seems to recognize that this is something extraordinary and beautiful just in his portrait. The mere fact that one of the biggest events in Germany between Game Start and Hitler dying are student protests demanding liberalization and reform are proof enough that the world isn't totally under the thumb of dictatorship. There's always hope. Even the tiniest spark of it is worth fighting for. What emphasizes this theme of hope for me personally is how TNO finally says that it will always triumph over hateful and purifying fanatics. Even if the worst comes to pass, if thermonuclear war engulfs the planet and you're left with Himmler's global plan coming to fruition, mankind does not perish. You get events, at first saddening, of people regretting their lives, dying in pain, and realizing their lives are over. After that, you get stories of communities coming together, of scientists relearning the history of the world, and finally, the last event in TNO. Thousands of years after the omnicide of Earth was attempted, mankind has rebuilt and returns to the moon. They find a flag, the end result of one of the first events of the game, Nazi Germany landing on the moon, but it has been bleached white from years and years of solar radiation. They don't know what it is or what it means. They only know it as a forgotten symbol of an era relegated to myth. And they fold it up, replace the flag with their own, and return to Earth. No matter what happens, mankind lives on, and the injustices of old are replaced by a new hope. The horrors of old are forgotten, as tyrants who claim the mantle of Ozymandias are overthrown, and at the end of the day, mankind can and will survive. I can think of no message more hopeful than that. Part 4 So, in a nutshell, what is TNO? It's a mod created by dozens of developers of their own free time and their own passion. It's a mod that does what the base game is unwilling to do and takes a good, hard, long look at the ideologies of fascism, communism, liberalism, and their various incarnations and mixes. It's a mod that manages to create the fear and terror of the Cold War even when there's no player character and your only interaction is from on high as god to your nation. If you play Hearts of Iron 4, I can wholeheartedly recommend it. If you don't, well, 
in all honesty, I can't in good conscience say buy a game just for the mod, but there's plenty of playthroughs to be seen if you're curious. I might upload the Spear one I recorded, though it wouldn't have commentary. It's a mod that wears actual literary themes on its sleeve and is open to a massive amount of interpretation. From intentions of characters to which nations are truly good or evil, if such terms even matter. Despite this, it doesn't claim every side is equally bad. It has a very clear set of targets. Authoritarianism, totalitarianism, fascism. It's a mod about how those systems are morally indefensible. It's about how Hitler's empire could never function, even in a world so impossibly built around him winning. The Nazi vision of the Eternal Reich can't be. The only good end to the Nazi Empire is for people who openly despise Nazism to, through political machinations, worm their way up into making its leader their puppet, and to collapse the Nazi system entirely. In essence, TNO celebrates the fact that mankind's spirit, that the desire for freedom and autonomy, will always trump a dictator's machinations. It condemns the idea of racial hierarchy and the desire to destroy others and does this by showing a world in which those ideologies are dominant, permeate the world, and will still, more often than not, fail. And even if they don't, and the worst comes to pass, and the logical conclusion of a desire to purify the world happens, mankind still survives, hopes, and dreams. Thank you for watching. I'd especially like to thank Admiral Akbar for letting me use Burgundian Lullaby. A link to it and the other music that I've used is going to be in the description, along with a link to my Patreon if you'd like to join the people scrolling by right now, it will be down there. Again, thank you for watching, I know this was a video that very few people currently subscribed to my channel are probably interested in, but I just felt I had to make something about this frankly remarkable achievement for a development team I used to be a part of.